now, where would you be? And, and I do have my answer for this one since I got to pick the question before. I would probably say that I would be on some island in the middle of nowhere because that sounds pretty good right now. <laughs> what about you, Audrey? Well, I, I, I have this... Um... I've seen this mug on the internet that says, and I quote, um, I don't need therapy. I just need to go to Taiwan. Um, so I, I guess <laughs> I prefer to remain right where I am. You cheated that answer. You, you just you're staying where you're at. Zoe, what about you? Um, I'd probably have to say Charleston, South Carolina. I have a lot of family there. So when it's all safe to go and hang out with them. Also, the beach is great. So yeah, I can't beat that. Seen Himalayas, Canada, California, Hawaii, yes, New York. You know, it's really painful. I'm I'm here in New York, um, and all of my family and friends back home in Australia, there is no pandemic there. Mm. They solved it a little bit like Taiwan, and here we are. <laughs> is that where you'd like to be, Jim? It's also summer. They've got oh. the Australian, they've got a tennis tournament called the Australian Open happening. Wow. They're just doing the most. <laughs> yes. I see Georgia. Do you mean the state in the U.S. or the country? Greece. Yes. Oh, cool. Cancun. Yes. I'm seeing like sharp contrast. Like people either want to be at beaches or they want to be somewhere super cold. So <laughs> forest. I'm seeing a lot of forest answers. Yeah. Japan, Alaska, Thailand. Mm. Awesome. These are all great answers. Well, since Rise is a global program, oh, Josh Mars, we may have people joining from these places that you guys wish you were at, which is pretty cool, honestly. Um, but anyway, we can go ahead and get started. Zoe's going to frame up the night, but I guess for Audrey, going to frame up the morning, whatever your time zone is. <laughs> so right, take it away. Right. It's 8 and 30 in the morning. <laughs> Ooh, sorry about my dog. Uh. There he goes. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this evening, or I guess morning for you, Audrey, um, on behalf of Civics Unplugged and Rise, just want to thank you all so much um, for hopping on. Um, we're going to be having two segments. So first, we'll be having an Ask Me Anything um, with the incredible Audrey Tang. And secondly, we're going to be having an info session about Rise, which is this incredible scholarship program. Gary has pinned the link in the comments over there. So please go and check that out and make sure to stay to the end because we'll be helping you walk through your application. But first, um, let's introduce our incredible guest, Audrey. Um, Audrey Tang is the Digital Minister of Taiwan, where they have led numerous initiatives under the mantra of fast, fair, fun, including the G0V project, making democracy accessible and participatory. Um, recently, thanks to Audrey's work and the resilience of Taiwan's democracy, Taiwan has had a dr drastic boost in the global rankings for democracy from 31st to 11th. Audrey, anything we should add there for your intro? Uh, yeah, sure. The GovZero initiative, or G0V, is, of course, important uh, for the civic tech. But for the government side, we also have this very cute spokesdog, a Shiba Inu, the name is Zong Chai, who explains everything from, you know, physical distancing when you're indoor, keep three of them away from one another, wear a mask, or uh, if you're outdoor, keep two of them away and wear a mask. But why wear a mask? Wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hands. Uh, so this is my public service announcement. I'm sad that we didn't think of that. <laughs> yes, that is the cutest public service announcement for COVID I have ever seen. Uh, yes, that makes social distancing seem easy. Um, but I guess we can go ahead and dive right into the questions here. Um, so obviously, Audrey, you work a lot with democracy, work a lot with technology. Um, and you know, there have been a lot of kind of questions about like where we see the future of democracy and technology going. So I'd love to just ask you, where do you see the intersection of democracy and technology going around the world. Well, to me, democracy is a type of technology. 
uh, when we talk about technology, we tend to think about industrial use of natural sciences. But democracy is also a set of technologies that's the application of social scientists, uh, meaning that, for example, in Taiwan, we're not content with only uploading three bits per person every four years, which is called voting, by the way. But also, uh, day-to-day democracy, for example, initiatives like petitioning on the internet. Uh, in Taiwan, we have a national participation portal, join the GOV, the TW, that that engages more than 10 million people. Uh, that's roughly half of our population. Uh, and so uh, more than one quarter of the petitions uh, there were from people who are not even 18 years old. So uh, the young adults and the young people uh, have agenda setting power way before they have the right to vote. And they have successfully petitioned for, for example, uh, banning the plastic straws in our national identity drink, the bubble tea, uh, among many other things. Uh, and so because of this, uh, people see democracy as something that they can participate not just through petitions, but also through presidential hackathon, which is bringing a, a good idea uh, that you have and work across sectors, for example, using an app to encourage people to uh, drink more from refillable bottles instead of from plastic bottles. Uh, and that was a hit. It's like Pokemon Go. You can um, complete missions just by checking into those uh, water refilling spots and so on. And once you get a trophy, five of those from uh, our president each year, then the trophy is a micro projector when turned on. It shows our uh, President Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you a trophy, uh, promising that whatever you did in the past three months will become national policy with all the budget and personnel required within the next 12 months. So that's presidential power as a form of hackathon award. And there's many other ways to participate through participatory budgeting, referenda, uh, sandboxes, uh, and, so, and so on. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is that um, it's not just about voting, and it's about a co-creation of new mechanisms to get people's common values out of various positions and that you can engage on a day-to-day fashion. Yeah, I love what you said about democracy being a, it's, it's a type of technology in and of itself. And it, you know, definitely looks like the U.S. has quite a ways to go um, before we can get, um, you know, to that point of really integrating um, traditional technology and democracy. Um, you know, a big thing I know a lot of us, you know, we're in the midst of this pandemic um, you know, a lot of countries have handled it very differently, but Taiwan has had a really incredible response with the use of technology. And so we had um, somebody who registered wondering if you think that this idea of a digital based pandemic response um, is would work in other countries, you know, from third world countries to first world countries and also where you got the idea from. Well, um, as I mentioned, the, the Shiba Inu, the cute uh, spokesdog, really uh, doesn't need a lot of broadband access or something. It works perfectly well in, in low bandwidth situations. And the other two uh, digital interventions that play the, the most part uh, actually also requires very basic infrastructure. For example, um, there's this uh, daily press conference uh, from our medical officers led by Minister Chen Shizhong, uh, the Minister of Health and Welfare. Uh, and again, this could be broadcasted by radio by television, uh, by any sort of, of course, we use live stream, but it doesn't really depend on the internet. And the other important part, the toll-free number 1922, uh, where anyone who see anything um, new about the COVID situation can call and receive the explanation and answers from the scientist. And if um, they bring something that the call center people and the scientist doesn't have an answer to, for example, last uh, April, there was a young boy who called saying, you're rationing out mask, but all I get is pink medical mask. All my uh, um, the boys in, in my class, all of them have blue masks, and I don't want to wear pink to school. What to do? And, and the scientist doesn't know how to answer that, so he got escalated immediately uh, to the Central Epidemic Command Center. And the very next day, the next 2 p.m., in the daily press conference, uh, the press um, officers uh, suggested that all the medical officers wore pink medical masks. And they continued to do that for a number of weeks, and the uh, trending bronze and things like that all colored uh, their brand pink. So pink became the most hip color, and the boy became become the most hit boy in the class where only he has the color that the heroes wear. And uh, Mr. Chen even said the Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. So also heroes hero wear. So all, all this requires um, innovation, co-creation, but it doesn't require any sort of like broadband as human right as we have here. You can as easily put it together with regular television, radio, and also toll-free number through landlines. Yeah, that is, that is so adorable that he didn't want to wear pink and then he made it cool across all of Taiwan. That is super, super cool. Uh, and so I know a lot of our, um, you know, we have CU fellows here and RISE applicants and a lot of kids here 
who are super interested to just hear more about your Go Zero project and also the fact that you share every single conversation you have. Mm-hmm. That has a crazy level of transparency mm-hmm. um, from a government official. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of us are just wondering, um, you know, what inspired you to start both of these initiatives and where mm-hmm. do you see government transparency going? Sure. And what do you want to see? Yeah, I, I learned about this idea of uh, rough consensus and radical transparency when I was 15 years old. Uh, that was 1996. Uh, Taiwan just had its first presidential election. Uh, and I told my um, the middle school's uh, principal, uh, Principal Du Hui Ping, uh, saying that I don't want to go to school anymore because I discovered this new thing called the World Web and the knowledge is being created there and it's at least 10 years ahead from my textbooks in the middle school which are all out of date anyway uh, and then the head of the school uh, read my email correspondence with some researchers and thought about one uh, one minute and said okay from tomorrow on you don't have to go to school anymore and and she covers for me meaning that she fixed the record but in any case so that I don't get fined by compulsory education so um, and after that I joined this fabulous uh, internet community uh, is to a around- it's called Internet Society. Uh, it, it makes the protocols, the kind of the core, the constitution laws uh, of the Internet. And uh, the idea of the Internet Society is that of uh, radical transparency because uh, we don't, in Internet governance, have a Navy or an Army or anything. We can't force any telecom operator or any jurisdiction to connect to the Internet. So we have to work with everyone, take all the sides, making sure that there is common value out of the various different positions so that the Internet remains a common public good or public infrastructure in the digital era. And so that's how I got into the internet style uh, politics. And it will not be another five years until I actually get to vote in a representational democracy system. So, so to me, I mean, this high bandwidth, uh, radical transparency based legitimacy uh, is my native uh, mode of operation. So when we occupy the parliament uh, in 2014, uh, instead of demonstrating as protesters, we demonstrated as demoers, meaning that we we showed the uh, half a million people on the street and many more online how to um, deliberate, listen at scale, so that we can come to shared values uh, across the uh, very uh, controversial trade agreement at the time with Beijing. And we succeeded, and the uh, Occupy was a success. The head of parliament took our consensus, uh, and then uh, all the public servants are suddenly very much willing to learn how to work with the internet community, not just for the people, with the people. And so that's how I become first a reverse mentor to a minister and now the digital minister. So uh, that's the kind of short story of how GovZero gets involved in everyday politics. Yeah, so I know we had some questions earlier kind of um, referencing kind of like the U.S. pandemic response, which I think is, you know, you could easily describe as kind of the opposite of what um, Taiwan has done over the last 10 months here. Um, And so we have a couple of people kind of asking like, you know, where do you, like, how do you, think the U.S. can, you know, adapt into this new space? How can we get more people willing to wear masks? It seems like that was a very easy thing to do in Taiwan, but something that we've definitely had a lot more controversy around. So what do you think made Taiwan ready or more ready, I guess I should say, for the pandemic? And then how do other countries Mm -hmm. catch up with that? Yeah. Well, I mean, we were inoculated as a society. Everyone in Taiwan above 30 years old remember 2003 when SARS or SARS 1.0, as I call it now, uh, when SARS 1.0 hit Taiwan, we had to lock down an entire hospital unannounced. The municipal government was saying different things from the central government. Uh, There was a mask shortage and, you know, all all the chaotic things that happened around the world this time happened in Taiwan on a smaller scale in 2003. I think one of the things that we did right, though, is that in 2004, the Constitutional Court told the legislature saying that the chaotic response, the sudden barricading of a hospital would be unconstitutional if not for the fact we none of us have any experience with SARS, right? So um, we need while the memory is still fresh um, institutionalized uh, to, for example the PPEs uh, how to uh, communicate correctly uh, about masks and how to uh, make the Central Epidemic Command Center, the daily press conference, the YNA22, all of these are authorized uh, by the legislature into 2004 in preparation of the next 
uh, version of SARS as we uh, saw in COVID-19. So, um, and one of the insights we uh, learned in 2003 was that um, if you say you wear a mask to protect the elderly, then people who don't live with the elderly don't wear a mask. If you say wear a mask to show respect uh, to the medical workers, well, people who don't know any medical workers don't wear a mask. But if you say, like the cute dog uh, says, and, and I show it on the very beginning, if you say wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hands, then, then this is a message that appeals entirely to rational self-interest. Even if there's no one around, you will still wear a mask because, well, it protects you against your own unwashed hands. And it connects it with hand sanitation uh, because without hand sanitation, wearing mask doesn't do much anyway, right? So, so this sort of um, idea was spreading, which appeals to rational self-interest, uh, makes this message viral, meaning that people will voluntarily share this with their friends and families. And if you build it as something that's all altruistic is much harder to spread. Yeah, that is awesome. I'll say we have a really good question from Caleb here um, asking, um, and I'll just read it. Um, how would you suggest young people on a smaller level apply some of the open source you know, democratic practices you've helped pilot on a larger level in Taiwan? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So uh, in Taiwan, many uh, children are now um, working with the, their schools to design their school curricula. Because uh, in the past couple of years, we've switched uh, to a curriculum that has a lot of uh, freedom in it. Uh, instead of uh, emphasizing memorization or um, like the um, so-called the correct answer or any top-down sort of learning, we've switched to a more like Finland-like uh, way of curriculum where we don't teach, for example, media literacy anymore or data literacy anymore because literacy assume you are a reader or a viewer. We teach instead media competence, uh, data competence, uh, mean that you are a producer because in Taiwan broadband is a human right. So no matter how remote the child is, they are guaranteed to have access to 10 megabits per second of bandwidth both ways at just 16 US dollars per month for unlimited data. If they don't, it's my fault personally. Uh, and so because we've achieved more than 99% of coverage in terms of residents, uh, there is uh, a very strong um, um, will to fact check the presidential debates, for example, which is a great way to learn about media competence uh, and the newsroom, how the newsroom works and so on. Uh, and it, it's fun, right? When you're fact checking all the three presidential candidates in their uh, platforms and their debates and so on, um, it imbues in, uh, in you uh, a network to the uh, amateur and finally the professional uh, journalists and everyone learns a little bit more journalism uh, as part of this fact-checking. And there's many other things to do as well. There's many primary schoolers uh, that uh, work with the environment uh, sensing, that's climate science, uh, with uh, the very inexpensive um, tool called the Airbox, and it's less than 100 US dollars each, and there's literally thousands of them, each measuring the PM 2.5, that's air quality, and sharing it to a distributed ledger um, mentioned by Academia Sinica, the Taiwan National Academy. Um, and what, what this does, uh, as visual by the Gov Zero map is that it showed people exactly how the uh, mobile sources, the immobile sources, uh, the various um, sources of pollution and also from overseas um, can affect the everyday feeling of air and quality. And so together, the primary schoolers identify the um, kind of gaps uh, where there's no uh, citizen science scientist. For example, in industrial parks, it's impossible for them to break and enter <laughs> industrial parks to, to get the air uh, sensors there. Uh, so they petitioned and worked with the Environmental Protection Agency here, and the EPA uh, agreed and worked with the municipality because it turns out we own the lamp. The government owns the lamp in those industrial parks. So we mm -hmm. took their design, installed it on the lamps, and all together contribute to climate science. And so that's something that any primary schooler can do um, in a day or two's work just to set up an airbox. And so it's all about uh, identifying the uh, sustainable goal. Uh, there's 17 sustainable goals um, that you care about and then link to communities that care about those goals and then uh, just make something happen. Uh, and before long, the government will take notice of it. Wow, that's, that is incredible. Um, we have this a really good question about incorporating internet into government. I know that there have been a lot of kind of pushes in the U.S. that, you know, we should start voting on our phones and all this stuff to make that, you know, make those government systems more accessible. But there's been a lot of pushback. 
is I think this person just wondering how have you encountered any difficulties incorporating the internet and technology so intrinsically, like so, you know, woven throughout government? And then what, I guess, recommendations would you have for other countries that, you know, inevitably will have to follow the same path? Yeah, I would definitely start with broadband as a human right, because if there's no uh, broadband as human rights, then any uh, advance that we make on digital democracy will be almost by definition excluding the people who do not have broadband access, who can only download uh, video but couldn't uh, share through video conference as we are doing so now, right? So broadband mm -hmm. as human right definitely the, the first step. And the next step uh, is to make sure that people understand what's actually happening um, in the government and we in the national participation uh, portal it's not just that we put we the people like petition portal the same portal also shows all the upcoming regulatory drafts like regulation.gov in the US and also shows all the national budgets neatly visualized so you can have a real conversation with the public servants in res uh, in response to any particular budget item that you want more information from there's no equivalent of that in the US uh, and so uh, once uh, this a uh, whole life cycle of a policy from ideation uh, to the drafts, uh, to the budget, to the execution and implementation. And of course, it will, of course, always have something to improve. So you can go back uh, to the petition, to the ideation. Once this uh, life cycle is uh, experienced by the local people uh, for a couple of times, then people understand that democracy is something that they can participate in their spare time. But if this is just about voting uh, in one of those uh, points in the life cycle with no prior consultation, nor or of post uh, accountability, then it feels very much empty because you don't know uh, how those votes will be used. So a full life cycle visualization that is also very important. Yes, and I think we have a really great question that kind of you know follows along with that, that broadband should be a human right. People should have access to the internet and that it's a great tool to help advance democracy, but at the same time can really tear it down. And I think in the US especially, we've seen the effects of you know, internet and social media um, on affecting our democratic system. So I think what uh, the student's asking is, should information be regulated? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, uh, but by social media, I, I think uh, we have very different ideas of social media in mind. Um, because in, in the U.S., I understand a lot of public discussion takes place in the, uh, infrastructure maintained by the private sector for the mm -hmm. purpose of selling addictive uh, advertisements and entertainment. Uh, and this is very much akin to have a public debate or deliberation, not in a public park, not in a museum or library or, or town hall, but rather in a, I don't know, nightclub that sells addictive drinks, right? So um, basically, the, the social media media becomes antisocial uh, because uh, it, it wasn't designed for public deliberation. It's designed for addictiveness, for selling advertisements and so on. Uh, when in Taiwan we uh, say social media, we think uh, of the social sector run media platforms. And by social sector, I mean something like uh, people's um, uh, co-ops, um, the coll collaborative uh, project out of the academia, for example, the National Taiwan University, uh, a bunch of uh, students have been running a site pet project that's entirely not for profit, has no advertisers nor shareholders, really, um, and it's called the PTT. It's the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit that has no obligation to shareholders or advertisers, but rather just uh, governed by the people who participate, and it's open source, by the way, you can find the source code on GitHub. So, uh, it is on PTT instead of on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, that's the Dr. Li Wenliang's message uh, around the end of uh, 2019 that says, and I quote, there are seven new SARS cases. It gets first uh, reposted on the PTT by a young doctor with the name Normal Pipe, uh, and people just start uploading her message and uh, triaging uh, the message to say that it actually looks legit, that it looks like a real SARS case is happening again. And this, uh, in turn, makes it possible for us to start health inspection for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan the very next day, the first day of 2020. But imagine uh, if this is strong um, amidst uh, those divisive, um, antisocial, polarized um, views uh, in a more antisocial corner of the private sector run social media, then uh, chances are that it will not be discovered or triaged that efficiently and that quickly. Um, and so I think the, the main point I want to get across is that antisocial media and pro-social media are both 
use uh, social media, uh, but the true social media that can serve as a digital public infrastructure, like your local parks and libraries, need to be run by the social sector uh, with a deliberate um, empowerment by the public sector, saying that we are going to run our town hall there instead of on the nearby nightclub. Wow, that's awesome. I'm going to pass it off to Madison because I know she has a couple of questions too. Yeah, so we all know that Audrey is very experienced in technology, but now we're going to talk about a topic that was touched on a little bit earlier, which is education, something that Audrey also knows a lot about. So it's kind of clear to people that there's a stigma against students taking an untraditional education path, whatever that means for different students. Many see it as a sign of low intelligence or even a lack of ability. But in your case, as we touched on a little bit already, it was the exact opposite. So maybe it would be cool if you could talk a little bit more about what led you to leave the education system of Taiwan. And to follow that up, how would you design the education system to be more adaptable to those alternative paths? Yeah, um, I think in Taiwan, uh, we've had more than 10 years, a decade of um, what we call the experimental education system. Uh, and the uh, system allows up to 10% of students in Taiwan. Um, nowadays also covers the higher education as well, but uh, previously only on the basic education level up to 18 years old to basically write up their own curriculum and say that I want to study it with my family, with my friends, with this institution that's definitely not a school, uh, and things like that. And as long as it looks uh, legit um, to the uh, municipal review board, then they can just go ahead and uh, follow that curriculum. Uh, and so, uh, and enjoy the same rights and um, the, the responsibilities of any uh, children of the same age. And so because of this, there's less of a stigma when you have uh, literally like 10% of of people uh, just adopting their own curricula. So we, we see uh, them, and by them I say also us, I guess, because I'm also a <laughs> homeschooler. Uh, I, I see uh, experimental um, education people as more like a research arm to the basic education curricula. And after 10 years of research, uh, we figured out something that works really well uh, for the Taiwanese uh, society. For example, the emphasis on autonomy, on um, interaction, on the common good. And these are what motivates uh, people. And there's also alternate education that focus more on rote memorization and so on, uh, but with assistive intelligence, it's less um, convincing uh, to the Taiwanese society now, and so on. So after 10 years of uh, like a swarm of um, experimental education methods, we uh, picked the ones that did work and write it into the basic education curriculum so that nowadays, even in the basic education, you still have hours uh, of capstone projects, of um, like learning across different uh, generations, across different disciplines, across different places, and so on. Uh, and so anyone who wants uh, the curriculum to change a little bit can work with their school-based curriculum committee without writing their entire curriculum itself. And now the alternative education uh, community, after getting merged, right, they started as a fork uh, of the basic education. After that go gets merged, now shifted to a even more radical um, experimentation, for example, using the entire city as a campus instead of having any particular campus of the indigenous nations uh, doesn't learn uh, Mandarin or English uh, from the very beginning, but start with their own language and so on. So like even more uh, daring experiments uh, to the curriculum. But I think this general research versus development relationship is the relationship that can ease a lot of the stigma. Absolutely. And it makes me wonder because I think about the metric system we use in the U.S. especially to measure like how students are learning. So that's grades, standardized tests. And I'm sure that the traditional like standardized system in Taiwan is similar. So I'd like to hear more about how those metrics change for a lot of the experimental education mm -hmm. that you've uh, mm -hmm. heard about. And in the future, how can we create metrics that both allow people freedom to choose mm -hmm. their education? path, but also mm -hmm. ensure that they're actually learning and mm -hmm. becoming prepared for yeah, th this is a great question. Uh, in Taiwan, we've ab abolished uh, all the metrics that's based on individual to individual competition, uh, which used to be, you know, the thing when I was a child. <laughs> but, but we did away with that altogether, so so people would not feel 
pressured uh, relative uh, to their classmate can actually start to form uh, co-creation teams with their classmates. Uh, and that's one of the main uh, impetus to the um, curriculum reform a couple years ago uh, that took uh, effect a, a couple years ago. And the other thing is that on higher education, <coughs> we're now focusing on um, the kind of day-to-day -day, um, journeys uh, of the people in their basic education so that uh, when you're applying, for example, for a university, University. Now, uh, more than half of the consideration will be by the actual project that you have um, contributed. And this is what we call PBL, or purpose-based learning. Uh, that is to say, if you can uh, determine uh, your capstone project's purpose, usually with the help of the sustainable development goals, because there's uh, like a very clear target of 169 target across the 17 global goals, which serves as a great framework of how much uh, common purpose your personal project has been contributing to the world. And using that as a common criteria, it's much more easy for the university to assemble the student who have completed all sorts of different portfolios together so that they can achieve something larger uh, during their undergrad study as part of, for example, the University Social Responsibility Program or USR in Taiwan, which allows people to earn uh, credits or even finish a um, graduate level diploma solely by solving something that is of common value to the local environmental or social development. And so I think the um, SDGs uh, is a really good example. And that's why uh, we always frame uh, every work that, that I do, even my job description, uh, in terms of the 17 global goals. See, I love that because it's not just about project-based learning, being able to create a project, it's purpose-based learning. Like the project has to have purpose. And so I love that. And, and Rohan asked an interesting question here, um, says Taiwan's economy is diversified but how would a plan like this work for developing countries, I'm guessing in terms of education? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, Taiwan uh, was a developing country not too long ago, certainly when I was a child. Uh, and we only become the developed country in WTO, I think a couple years back. And only this year we become a full democracy, right? So we still remember how, how it was uh, when Taiwan was a developing country. And I think uh, in Taiwan's uh, trajectory of development in our constitution, uh, we put in our constitutional amendments uh, three things. Uh, the state needs to guarantee uh, universal health care, um, universal education, especially on a basic education level, and universal communication uh, that includes, of course, broadband as a human right. And having these three promises uh, that forms our kind of socialist core, <laughs> everything else is on the capitalist core, right? <laughs> this dual core uh, constitution uh, really makes sure that when people want to uh, diversify their interests and so on, there is a safety net because they could be uh, assured that both their um, grandparents or their grandchildren <laughs> will enjoy pretty good health and um, education and communication rights while they can pursue uh, their different ideas of design, of uh, society changing innovations and so on. And if they fail loudly and quickly, uh, and then people thank them for it because then it uh, drives the society forward. So have a good uh, safety net. I think uh, this is really really important, also important to build solidarity across people who um, like uh, believe in different um, positions, uh, because if you have a good safety net, then people can always go back and say, hey, uh, we nevertheless managed to agree, for example, um, like family value is important, despite uh, one side saying that uh, the traditional families uh, need to be respected, and one side says the marriage equality uh, need to be addressed. And so uh, we went together and co-created this um, social innovation called uh, marrying the uh, bylaws, but not the in-laws. So in Taiwan, when two same-sex people People wed, um, they wed as individuals, but their families don't form kinship relationships. And so that um, makes two, both sides happy, or at least uh, like uh, happier. Uh, and that's how we get to the first uh, country in Asia to legalize marriage equality without leaving a large gap, uh, a large resentment uh, in the society. So uh, I think that's uh, also thanks to the uh, communication broadband as a human rights of people across all generations can feel safe to express uh, their views and contribute to this final um, like implementation of the social innovation. Absolutely. And what you said about just how interconnected everything is really struck me because it's not just like an isolated good education system. It's an overall flourishing democracy because like you said, people aren't going to want to take risks with their education 
or their career if they don't feel like they have that safety net and the support. And so that kind of goes on to another question in line with education. So, I mean, right now there is an overwhelming number of career choices and many of us struggle knowing what the right path is. I know that a lot of the audience members probably resonate with that as well. And it seems as though you knew what you wanted to do and go into tech early on. Mm -hmm. So what helped you find that perfect fit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's because I was very much into mathematics, but I really do not like math. Uh, that's to say hand-based calculations. Uh, and so uh, when I discovered that computers can well compute uh, for me, uh, it's like the what Steve Jobs called a bicycle of the mind, right? I still control the direction, uh, but now I can uh, do much more uh, with, my, with my mind on the mathematical concepts instead of being bogged down uh, by the calculations. And later on, I also discovered the internet, as I mentioned, uh, on the internet, uh, I don't have to do everything by myself, right? I can just find something that has uh, worked 80% uh, to my um, imagined purpose, and I just fulfill the other 20% and then share it again to the community so that they can pick it up and uh, develop it again. And so basically, uh, a internet-based community is what I would suggest because that makes sure that you don't feel alone, even if you are the only person in your neighborhood caring about, I don't democracy as a technology, uh, then uh, by joining um, Civics Unplugged, uh, you can find like-minded people who care about the things in pretty much the same angle. And with that in mind, you can then uh, feel free to explore whichever implication that this idea brings you and always knowing that whatever you learned, uh, successful or not, will be of broad use and benefits to your community. And so internet-based community, I think, is the main uh, answer because I engage the community as early as when I was 12, uh, so I've never felt alone and I always feel supported no matter how many turns that I make uh, in my so-called career because it's, I'm really a slash. So I'm at the moment a digital minister at TW slash uh, board member Radical Exchange. I was co-founding something with Vitalik uh, Buterin and trying out on the Ethereum community and slash, um, for example, board member uh, in the Digital Future Society, which thinks uh, how to apply telecommunication uh, to the future of assistive intelligence, collective intelligence, and so on. So anything uh, that I feel interested in, I just add another slash to my job description. And that's also something that's only possible because of the internet community uh, that I engage with. Yes, Audrey, you're preaching to the choir in terms of uh, digital first communities. RISE and CU are both first of its kind digital communities for young people. And I know that for me, it completely changed my life plan in terms of my education and what I want to do in the future. So totally resonate with that. And I think that that's so key as well. And so another question a participant wanted to know obviously, you are the digital minister of Taiwan, you've had a lot of success in technology. So people want to know, is there a secret to being successful in technology? What helped you become so successful at a young age? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the secret is um, you're always successful if you bring technology to the people. And you're rarely successful when you ask people to adapt to technology. Uh, and so this is what I mean by assistive intelligence, assistive technologies. Because if you are a, a technologist, uh, you have two different ways to think about things like AI. You can think assistively, meaning that you design something uh, like my eyeglass, good example. The person who designed the eyeglass really doesn't have any control over how I use my eyeglass. And it is lying to me, meaning that I want to see better, it helps me see better. Uh, and it's accountable, meaning that if, if uh, fails in some way. I can repair it myself or I can bring it to another person who can repair it without asking permission or even knowledge uh, from the original designer of this particular class. But imagine if instead of assistive technology, they uh, chose the authoritarian technology way, then the eyeglass will probably uh, you know, see what I see and pop up a advertisement for 10 seconds uh, when I they uh, deem that I see something interesting. And when if it fails, I'll probably have to pay like $10,000 in license fee before even attempting to reverse engineering the source code and things like that. So, so they may have control, but uh, actually uh, it goes against uh, most of the time with the personal rational self-interest of the person uh, using the um, eyeglass. And so before long, the eyeglass will not uh, be used. I'm not saying uh, anything about any particular brand, but what I'm trying to say is that if it's aligned to the people, if you design in a way uh, with uh, humility, uh, impact 
empowering your、um, fellow citizens instead of treating them merely as users, as some other industry that treats its customers as users,、um, then uh, you will uh, work always successfully because the things that doesn't work、uh, in the、um, actual field, people will be able to then fix it to reappropriate your technology and on an appropriate way. That's what we call appropriate technology, and you will learn from the people who remix your technology, and it's all, all in all a good community. But if you、uh, keep to the authoritarian path, and you have to make all the decisions, and human are human beings, you can't really anticipate all the use cases, and therefore, it's much harder to succeed. Absolutely, and to relate back to what you were talking about earlier with democracy as a technology, that seems to me part of the secret why Taiwan's democracy has been just so flourishing. It's because it, it follows kind of like what you said, like the secret makes it about the people. And I just think that that's super cool. I, I had never thought about it like that. So yeah, and then another question: the audience is composed of fifteen to seventeen year olds from around the world, as we've mentioned. So we want to know what advice would you give to fifteen-year-old Audrey?、Mm -hmm. Yeah,、uh, well, fifteen-year-old, I'm already dropped out of the middle school、uh, and already、uh, started my first company,、uh, co-founded it,、um, and so I think my my main recommendation、uh, to 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 the fifteen-year-old Audrey、uh, is that even though your English、uh, is pretty. Bad at the time,、uh, it's not a problem. Just start traveling around the world because、uh, people don't care about uh, uh, pronunciations,、uh, about the accents. People don't care about the grammatical errors, right? If you you just、uh, say what's on your mind, people figure it out anyway. That's how the world works.、Uh, because、uh, because my English wasn't that good to begin with.、Uh, I waited until when I was twenty five years old to start touring the globe、uh, to basically couch surf. Like twenty cities、uh, in a very short time span of two years, and I was、um, like very、um, self-conscious about my my English、uh, ability.、Uh, but then、uh, I discovered it's it's not a problem at all. This is not、uh, something that you need to score a perfect score、uh, in order to to communicate with your fellow Homo sapiens, your fellow、uh, human beings. A little bit of grasp of vocabulary、uh, can can be quite sufficient, and so that would be my main suggestion. Absolutely, and I think that is all the questions we have, Audrey. I know that you are very busy, so seriously, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us,、mm -hmm. and thank you all for submitting your questions before the event and now.、Um, now we are going to transition to talking more about Rise. So, Audrey, you、okay. can stick around. I said I know you're busy.、Yeah. Thank you for the great questions,、uh, and have a good local time, everyone. Live long and、okay. prosper. Bye. Bye.